All right, joining us now, former FBI special agent, national security expert. He's the CEO of the Sufan Group, the author of 2011 New York Times bestseller, The Black Banners, the inside story of 9-11, the war against Al-Qaeda. His new book, Anatomy of Terror, from the death of bin Laden to the rise of the Islamic State, uh, a guy who I uh, first pursued and courted professionally and then personally, and we've been together for a long time now. Uh, <laughs> Ali Soufan is here, ladies and gentlemen. We're very excited to have you. Congratulations on your new book, Anatomy of Terror, from the death of bin Laden to the rise of the Islamic State. I had, no idea you were, I had no idea you were even writing this book. Ah, uh, come on. You knew about the book. I don't. I, 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 I just I all of a sudden prove... I got the book in my in the mail. No, 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 I just no. get a book. And I'm like, ah, I thought we were friends. See, you would think that he would tell me. For for all your audience, I have my phone, and there is a text message here where oh, I'm dear. talking to oh, you dear. about the book. See, in the FBI, we always keep our notes, my friend. Oh, I've heard. So yeah. <laughs> um, so I have a memo here. Oh, you really do. I've heard. I've heard that. <laughs> oh, well, before we get to the book, I've got it. This is you know, this is the shitty thing about you releasing this book right now that everybody that gets access to you to talk about the the the, the hard work that you put in this book, which is such an important series uh, topic, has to ask you, ask you some kind of FBI related question. So I'm gonna yeah. make mine. I'll make mine short. Is that is go that ahead. annoying or do you do you like waiting on it? No, no, definitely go ahead. Uh, do, uh, I, do, I love to talk about just, this kind of stuff. Okay, just real quick. Well, dr- can you just quickly text James Comey just to get so we can yeah, get a quick get, quote from him? Can you that get us would Comey? really help us out. Can you get us uh, Comey? Yeah, no, he's not responding to my text. Okay. He's not. Now. I heard somebody said he they saw him puttering around in his lawn. I'm like, what does that look like well, the day all, after? All I want to know is if anyone has ever seen him dunk a basketball because he's That's so That's a good tall. question. Do you think, he, can James Comey dunk? Do you have any insider information on uh, He used to be a basketball player, man. But yeah, you don't know absolutely. if he can dunk. Oh, I bet so he you can he can. dunk a basketball. Okay. I, He's six eight. He doesn't yeah. even need to dunk. He just put his hand up. You were in the FBI. You still have friends. Uh, I've met a couple of them that are still in the FBI. Um, what was the kind of feeling about James Comey within the FBI? Even? Look, he's he's very well liked uh, he's, right now he's by FBI guy. agents. Even even right now, and I think a lot of people in the FBI uh, were upset, and they were upset about his firing, not because he was a great director. They were upset about his firing because it was done in such a cowardly way. He fi- he fired the apprentice uh, people in the apprentice with more. Uh, yeah. I mean, more respect. it's not uh, Gary Busey uh, got better respect. Uh, than, exactly. I yeah. mean, this guy is sitting in his uh, L.A. office uh, among uh, his agents and his support staff, and he sees it on television. Uh, this is not the, terribly insulting embarrassment. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. This is not uh, the way the United States government works. This is probably the White House edition of The Apprentice. <laughs> right. And uh, now I have to ask you about Robert Mueller because I believe he was your boss when you were at the FBI. A great man, and I think. Um, uh, Trump is going to realize that he made a huge mistake by firing Comey because he got Mueller. <laughs> and Mueller is uh, a man with great integrity, great honor. I worked for him. I served uh, under him. Mueller was the guy who led the FBI in one of our most difficult times after 9-11. He uh, stood up for uh, civil liber- liberties and creating that balance between our civil liberties, our constitutional values, and the so-called war and terror of the Bush administration. Um, I personally have a lot of positive experiences with him uh, operationally and tactically, but uh, the one that I can talk about uh, is the one that I already talked about publicly, uh, torture. Um, when uh, we experienced uh, what was happening uh, in the so-called black sites, um, I spoke with the VH headquarters and um, Robert Mueller was amazing. He supported us 100%. He said, we don't do this. Uh, and he pulled us out from uh, that program. And uh, later on, when we stood up against illegal wiretapping, uh, Mueller and Comey uh, were together, hand in hand, uh, fighting against the administration, mm. fighting against the White House. Uh, they actually uh, left their resignation letters on their desks. Did they really? Yeah, before they went to meet George Bush. And then George Bush wrote about it in his own book. I did not know that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Him, 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 and Comey. Uh, they wrote the resignation letters, left it on their desks, and they went to the White House to meet the president. And then the president, in his own book, said, "I thought I'm going to have a Saturday night massacre on my hand, so I backed off. I backed off." Well, he didn't the, have Jared uh, Kushner program. advising him. Um, th- I mean, so much has gone on uh, throughout this. Uh, but my final question is <clears throat> about. You hear a lot of folks, certainly on the right and in the conspiratorial uh, corners, but then others as well saying, listen, you don't go you don't go up against 
the intelligence community. Uh, some people call it the deep state, which is ridiculous because there are, you know, we don't the, have deep state. They have it in this Turkey. Is, is we don't have it. In, uh, uh, there's not the FBI and ridiculous C- notion. CIA and, and NSA yeah. uh, aren't uh, uh, pulling. But but if you are um, a huge asshole to them on a regular basis, if you embarrass them, if you insult them, people who are doing their job every day to keep Americans safe, uh, and, and and if you call out specific, eventually, aren't I mean, isn't it possible that they are going to then leak on you, or they are going to maybe not look the other way when you say, you know, what, could you let this guy go? Let, let this guy go. No, you're a dick. I'm not letting anybody go. It's <laughs> certainly not you. You're being a dick to everybody that I work with. Look, you know, I, I and I think I know the intelligence community from inside. I served in the intelligence community for many many years, and I can tell you the men and women uh, in the community are extremely professional, and they don't make the law. They don't make the rules. They just follow them. Uh, but, but also they're human at the same beings. Time, but, but also at the same time, when you have situations like this, we don't know who's leaking, right? But when we have a situation where the president openly talking that he fired the FBI director because he was thinking about the Russia investigation, openly asking for an oath of allegiance, something, you know, bin Laden will ask for or uh, Jangari will ask for, you know, from the FBI director who already took an oath of allegiance to the United States to the Constitution and our right. laws and right. our flags. Um, so when you have a situation where uh, you refuse to give him the oath of allegiance and then he tested you two days later or three days later uh, by inviting you to the White House and asking the vice president and the attorney general to leave the room and say, hey, you know what? Why don't you drop that case? Uh, he's a good man. Allegedly. You know, allegedly. Uh, I, I personally believe that these memos exist and I believe that these things happened because um, that is normal. If uh, as an FBI agent and as an FBI director, uh, anyone in the FBI experienced some awkward situation during an ongoing investigation, you have to document it. That is that is actually standard operating and procedures. That, and that documentation FBI. is somehow given a, a lot of respect in court. What's it called? The word. There's a C word. Well, you know what? It's, it's, it's not. It, it's not about. Look, if it, you t- if you took notes right. right after our conversation, um, it's it's going to be the considered. Notes, the notes themselves are not evidence, right? Um, but your statement is evidence. So, for example, let's say Comey at one point is testifying about that conversation. They're going to ask him, and how do we know that that conversation took right. place? And he will say, "Well, I." Recorded so fine. So then in this, this case, memo. in this case, the president says it didn't happen. I didn't say that. I mean, isn't always his word against the president's? Well, well you know, a lot of uh, bad guys and a lot of subjects they do the same thing. <laughs> Almost yeah. every terrorist guy that I prosecuted, oh, I didn't say that. And then <laughs> you know, the judge and the prosecution and the defense and the jury, they look at the evidence, they look at the memos. Seems they look like a at thing the you'd notes, say, sir. And then they will be like, okay, yeah, whatever. The new book is so good. I really am enjoying it. It's called Anim- Thanks, Anatomy of Terror. Ali Sufan is the author. He wrote the bestseller, uh, The Black Banners. You should also get that book. I've learned more uh, from from his writing and from his work uh, when it comes to these issues regarding Al-Qaeda uh, and the like than anything else that I've read or heard about. Also, uh, just search our guest Ali Sufan's name and torture, and you'll see nobody has more credibility uh, and honesty and transparency on that and being against it uh, at I and I've used it many times as, as an argument. Uh, so, you are apologizing for terrorists in this book. Uh, explain yourself. <laughs> explain. Um, this book is not a terrorism book in a sense that it talks about policy. Right. This is a book where you delve into the personality of uh, men who created a lot of bloodshed and a lot of suffering around the world, uh, trying to understand where they uh, come from, what are their motivation. And it's not to create sympathy to them or not even to create empathy for them. It is, it's more to basically create better understanding of what's going on. So now what happens in, uh, wh- why I want to do it this way, 16 years after 9-11, we still have no idea about the nature of the enemy. We don't even have an agreement inside the United States on what we call the enemy. Do we call them Islamic extremists, uh, Islamic radicals, uh, terrorists, uh, violent extremists? And this book 
can put everything in perspective for you. Understand the enemy through their eyes. So you see Osama bin Laden, for example, who is actually a character in the book. He introduces Al-Qaeda from the time they were kicked out of Afghanistan after 9-11 until he was killed. His relationships with his commanders, his relationships with his family, yeah. his plans, the way he viewed the Arab Spring, the way he wanted to take advantage of the chaos that ensued the Arab Spring. You see it through the eyes of his uh, main security chief, who was at one point the interim leader of Al-Qaeda, uh, Saif al-Adil. Um, then you see it from the commanders yeah. of all the different affiliates that Al-Qaeda have around the world to include the most rogue of all the affiliates, uh, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, the leader of Al-Qaeda in Iraq that became later ISIS. Then you see the Syria civil war and Zawahiri and how um, that division started in the global jihadi movement and ISIS broke off Al-Qaeda. And then you un understand through characters, through a story, through a novel yeah. style uh, book, uh, the complexity of, uh, you know, uh, Turkish involvement, Iranian involvement, Gulf states involvement, all through characters, real characters, yep. real people based on real facts and real evidence. See, Pete, the, the thing that we always talked about after any terrorist attack, to include 9-11, you know, if you look at the 9-11 Commission, they called the 9-11 attack, the commission called it a failure of imagination, right? A failure of imagination. Because they said, we talked to so many people in the intelligence community and mostly everyone said, we could not imagine a plane hitting a building. Right. <clears throat> Then uh, you have, for example, Wolfowitz, who is... Uh, Paul you know, Wolfowitz, Paul Wolfowitz, yeah. Wolfowitz. be when really upset when he passes. When he was testifying about the Iraq war, he said, uh, we cannot imagine it's going to take more troops to secure Iraq after Saddam than taking him down. So we always depend on imagination, but Im our imagination is always limited by our own experiences, right. by our own prejudices, by, by our own history, by our own views of things. So what we need here, we need is a little bit of, to expand our imagination yeah. with empathy. And I don't mean empathy in the uh, colloquial sense. I mean it in the clinical sense, in having a deeper understanding of the enemy. You know, well, Sun Tzu said long time ago, if you know your enemy yeah. and know yourself, you will win a hundred times in a hundred battles. We need to know our enemy on that level. But it's it's very interesting because we were just talking in our last segment to this woman who works at a psychiatric ward, Ali, and and, and we're talking about how uh, punishment doesn't doesn't necessarily incarcerate people. And you talk about how we are as parents punishing people for bad behavior or rewarding them. And and psychologically, you want to punch somebody in the face who's done something horrible. Yeah. Uh, I, everybody understands that. They're totally understandable. But what you realize as an FBI interrogator that as much as you emotionally would want to hit somebody in the face for what they've done, I mean, uh, you lost a lot of friends on 9-11, uh, including your own mentor. You also wanted to solve the crime. You yeah. wanted to get to understand. And so what you did was you used the, quote, you know, traditional... Uh, techniques and you created a, a, a trust and that's what you're saying in this book uh, in terms of your theory understanding understand what the enemy. makes them do what they do why they make the choices that they make and so often what we do in media we fall back on it's their religion yeah and yeah. you can you can counter that in, in many ways and you do in this book uh, but you also take us inside the psychology because you got access. What did you get access to for this book? How did you? Well, it's you had a, 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 all, all of the, it, you had Bin Laden's personal diary or something. Well, there there are a lot of the documents that were found at Bin Laden's house. Um, I read through hundreds and hundreds of pages of these documents. It, that's and, not public, though, is um, it? Yeah, yeah, they have been oh, really? declassified. They have been declassified by the U.S. government. Oh. and I was able to kind of like piece these things Looking together. Looking for something to read, my daughter. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I looked book. at them. I looked at them as if um, I'm, an, I'm still in the bureau, I'm still on the job, and I'm trying to put the case together. Yeah. Um, and or, or, or I was trying to go and interrogate that specific individual. So I, I put it, and then there are a lot of open source, a lot of news uh, that probably is not widely reported. Um, you have your own knowledge of how this groups function. So I actually took all these pieces uh, of information that already exist and put it together in a way that uh, the reader 
uh, will finally get to understand the threat uh, that we have been facing for almost well, 20 years. How come you get this threat and people that, you know, obviously that work with you and for you that you respect understand this threat, but so many of our, you know, leaders don't, and obviously talking heads and microphones. And I mean, I can't imagine being you and watching cable news some days, you know, some jackass like me who just interviewed you goes on and says something. In that case, you'd probably like it. But, I mean, some other jackass that doesn't know what they're talking about arguing, for example, for torture or arguing for this technique or, or, or for invading that country. How how come you seem to understand this stuff so much better than many of our leaders on both sides well, of the aisle? And I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it's about, um, unfortunately, everything, to include national security, uh, became political. Uh, so people go with the talking points of, uh, you know, that specific political party or the other political party. So, you know, when you sit down uh, with those guys behind closed doors and you have a conversation with them, I think some of their views are a little bit different than the, the views that they they put publicly on, uh, on television. Uh, but this threat has been going on for a long period of time and the threat is mutated. So, uh, you know, Al-Qaeda and ISIS, it's not the same terrorist organizations that we were fighting back uh, you know, after 9-11. Al-Qaeda mutated now and became a network and they benefited greatly from the Arab Spring. So it's not an organization with a specific command and control uh, like bin Laden had in Kandahar, Afghanistan uh, before 9-11. Now it's a message and that message has affiliates in so many different places around the world. Bin Laden, uh, we talk, uh, you and I about this before, had 400 members of Al-Qaeda on the yeah. eve of 9-11. Today, Al-Qaeda in Syria alone has more than 20,000. Al-Qaeda in Yemen went up since the Saudi war in Yemen to about four to 5,000. New weapons, new uh, recruits, uh, everything you can imagine. Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, which operates in North Africa and the Sahel region. Uh, they finally were able to put their tribal and racial affiliations aside, and all of them pledged bayah to the Arab commander in Algeria, Abu Musab Abdel Wadud, who is basically the uh, regional uh, leader of Al-Qaeda in, 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 in North Africa. So uh, it differs. And we're still, when we want to fight Al-Qaeda, we're still fighting an organization with the same tactics that the use, we used uh, back when Al-Qaeda was a totally different Why? organization. Um, I think... Um, what are those for tactics? Many, for many reasons. Military tactics? For many reasons. Our counterterrorism strategy continue to focus on military and intelligence. So basically, we use a drone, and we think drones are enough to uh, limit uh, the threat and to drown that threat. Well, drown is uh, sorry. Drones are tactics. Drones are not strategy by themselves, right? So we need to basically um, widen uh, our imagination in the way that we fight Al Qaeda or we fight ISIS. Today, uh, the biggest problem we have is uh, cannot be solved militarily. The biggest problem we have is civil wars and geopolitical conflicts that's happening in places like Syria and places like Yemen and places like Libya and places like Somalia. We need a political solution for these conflicts because Al-Qaeda and ISIS are benefiting from the chaos that exists in these areas. And only when you have a political solution, the appeals of groups like this will start to be weakened. What? So diplomacy is extremely important. Then we have to counter the message. We have to counter the narrative. The narrative is, you know, the United States and the West is at war with Islam. These groups, they claim they are defenders of Islam. We need to show the hypocrisy of groups who claim they are fighting for the sake of Islam when they are blowing up marketplaces in the Muslim world, killing Muslims, blowing up mosques in the Muslim world, killing Muslims, uh, beheading Muslims. Uh, they are battling other Muslims in places like Syria, in places like Yemen, in places like, uh, you know, Iraq. Um, and and we, need, we need to expose that. Uh, unfortunately, especially with this administration and instead of doing that we say oh we're going to ban all muslims from coming here so basically we play into uh their playbook exactly but the difference between al-qaeda and isis right now what is their relationship what are their missions well we have to keep in mind that isis uh, was a branch um, that came out of al-qaeda tree 
right? So ISIS used to be Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Was it not co-founded by Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton? <laughs> it's not true? Yeah, if you, uh, if you want to believe that, uh, there's a wiretap at the Trump Tower. For it. <laughs> We'd have to believe that as well, then, <laughs> just to be consistent. Yeah. So Al-Qaeda in Iraq, Zarqawi. So uh, Zarqawi um, was the leader of Al-Qaeda's uh, branch in Iraq. They always had a problem uh, early on because of Zarqawi's... Uh, views of how to conduct so-called jihad was different than Zawahiri and bin Laden. Uh, but they uh, did little in order to control him. And uh, there was hostility between some of the top leaders in uh, the Islamic State of Iraq at the time and Zawahiri. The Syrian war uh, took that hostility to a totally different right. level where ISIS separated from Al-Qaeda. So now you have Al-Qaeda's affiliates in Syria, uh, most famously a Nusra Front, but there are many other affiliates uh, operate under Tahrir al-Sham, a group of uh, organizations. Those are Al-Qaeda's uh, groups in Syria. And then you have the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, or in Iraq and the Levant, which is ISIS. Um, there are no ideological difference uh, between them. Um, they have a plan, and their plan is basically three phases. Phase one, you uh, do a lot of terrorism to create chaos. Phase two, you manage that chaos and you prevent anyone else from filling the vacuum. Phase three, you establish a state and you have the final confrontation in the West. After the division that took a place between ISIS and Zawahiri, ISIS told Zawahiri, you know what? We went to phase three already. We established our state. Now you have to pledge oath to us. You have to work under us because we already have a state. Al-Qaeda said, no, 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 we're still in phase two. We don't want to establish a state. So now when ISIS go from a proto-state back to a terrorist organization, an underground terrorist organization, when there is no caliphate, when there right. is no caliph, when there is no state, and if there is no Zawahiri leading Al-Qaeda, because a lot of the hostilities focused specifically on Zawahiri, I can see a possibility of many people who are operating under ISIS today that they go back to Al-Qaeda. They go back to the mother organization. And I think Al-Qaeda is playing this big Trump card, no pun intended here, um, in um, um, uh, preparing Hamza bin Laden, bin Laden's son, to take over Al-Qaeda. So if Zawahiri steps and there steps down and Hamza bin Laden is the new leader of Al-Qaeda, mm. another bin Laden is leading Al-Qaeda in a, in a universe where uh, the caliphate doesn't exist, I think we possibly can see um, um, a situation where the global jihadi movement uh, is unified again under a bin Laden. Why do you think that? Who is Hamza bin Laden? How old is he? Hamza bin Laden is uh, about a 27, 28-year-old. Uh, he uh, was featured in Al-Qaeda's uh, 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 videotapes and propaganda tapes early on, um, f saying fiery speeches and fiery poems in front of his dad. Um, he is the son of bin Laden's favorite wife. Uh, she wasn't also his wife. Uh, she was also his advisor and his wordsmith and conciliary in so many ways. Uh, after 9-11, um, he was arrested with his mother. He was at, at, at the time about 13, 14 years old in Iran. Uh, and he was put in uh, jail with, uh, you know, other members of Al-Qaeda, top leaders of Al-Qaeda. He was groomed by those leaders. He was pushed by his mother more and more uh, to uh, go on Al-Qaeda's path. And then uh, when he was released from the Iranian jail based on uh, a hostage negotiation deal uh, with Al-Qaeda, uh, bin Laden was uh, anxiously waiting to meet him in order to prepare him and teach him himself uh, for um, to be to take over after him. Uh, but Bin Laden was killed before he had the opportunity to 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 meet Hamza. Uh, recently, Hamza issued uh, the total of five audio tapes. Um, they were um, issued by Al Qaeda's propaganda arm, as Sahab. And uh, interestingly enough, he keeps his father's tone and his father's message. Oh, really? He does not attack ISIS. He does not attack the Caliphate. He considers all of them being followers of his father. And he uh, uh, loves to uh, go back 
back to the traditional rhetorics of Osama bin Laden. You know, it's a fight against the Jews and the Crusaders, and we have to liberate the uh, land of the two holy mosques, meaning Saudi Arabia. All these old narratives that were said by Osama bin Laden, uh, even his messages to the American people, oh, you will never have peace in America until we have it in, in Gaza and, 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 and in Palestine. These messages he's repeating, and I think Al-Qaeda is preparing him uh, for for a bigger and bigger role. He got married to the daughter of the number two person in Al-Qaeda, oh. uh, Abu Musa, Abu, Abu Muhammad al-Masri. He, Abu Muhammad al-Masri has been, a, you know, with Al-Qaeda from the beginning. He was, a, he is actually still alive. He is a founding member. He mastered mind the uh, twin bombings in East Africa. He was actually involved with virtually every terrorist attack uh, against the United States. So he's married into uh, He's married into wow. it. Yeah. And and he's an Egyptian so he can kind of Hamza bring bin together Laden? No. Oh, uh, the other guy, the, Muhammad al Masri. Yeah. So uh, uh, where is he now? Bin Laden's 27-year-old uh, son who you're well, saying we is believe, the heir apparent. Uh we believe uh, he is in the Waziristan Pakistan area. Huh. Yeah, I mean it, 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 all really interesting, fascinating, and very important. But I think what probably a lot of people want to know is uh, w- how, what threats are posed to Americans in America. Yeah. You could perceive, uh, knowing nothing, that ISIS, uh, you already talked about this, and Al Qaeda are taking advantage of the chaos in Libya, uh, as well as in, obviously mm-hmm. in Syria and Yemen. Um, and they're trying to establish this caliphate. And so if, if you think about it that way, maybe they don't want to spend their resources uh, on on terrorism in United States or shooting down, taking down another plane because they don't want to be targeted uh, by this new president, by the United States military. Uh, they think if they just operate the way they do, like I'm just creating this narrative in my right. mind uh, and to hope that they don't attack us here again. Uh, the way they have. Well, we we need to be very careful not to repeat the same narratives that we, uh, you know, stated before 9-11. And that's why we get, uh, you know, caught off guard uh, with what happened on 9-11. You know, as long as uh, these organizations are growing, as long as they have more members, uh, more capabilities, uh, their main goal towards the end is to have a final confrontation with the West and the United States. And you can see that in the book and reading each and every one of these characters. So uh, we cannot just um, operate under the same way we operated after the jihad in Afghanistan, the Soviet jihad. You know, these are Mujahideen. They finished with the Russians. They're not going to attack us. You know, come on. We even supported them and we even helped them. And then we had the World Trade Center bombing. And then we had the uh, terror stop operation. And then we had the East Africa embassy bombings. And then we had the USS call. And every time it's like, ah, but they are overseas. They are not, they're not going to attack home. We have to be very, very careful with this uh, because these organizations towards the end, their main goal, especially under Hamza bin Laden, is to target the United States. And now they took advantage of the Arab Spring in creating back the network that was almost destroyed after 9-11. But one thing we have to keep in mind, and one thing extremely important to have to keep in mind, when do they realize that they reach the max in building the network? Then they're going to strike. Now, our intelligence and law enforcement community, you know, they've been doing a very effective job. But we are in a situation where the landscape, the terrorism landscape, is changing rapidly. How? And, 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 and and then we need to be basically aware of all the changes that's happening overseas. We need to understand, as I mentioned in the book about all these characters, what is the threats, what uh, what is the motivation, what is the goal of these people? and have a plans in order to be ready and not be caught off guard again. Last question, uh, and everybody go get this book right now, Anatomy of Terror. Uh, our guest, Ali Soufan, mentioned the USS Cole. He was the lead investigator on that, right? I mean, you, you were the guy who, who, who tracked down yeah. uh, the guys who bombed that ship. Uh, our guest is a hero. He's my friend. You should get this book. I'm telling you right now. Uh, it's so, so good. Um, you talk about our intelligence community. 
talk about the intel that they get and that they're trying to do their best, obviously. How important is sharing intelligence with the Germans, with the Israelis, and so on? Because what we heard this week was that our dumb president um, told Russians uh, intelligence that Israelis had gotten uh, about the laptop threat. And, uh, and and then the concern is that they stop telling us stuff because dumb dumb will uh, sing Well, this is uh, probably, Twitter. you know, there was tweet a lot it out. Of- there are a lot of lines that were crossed uh, with the intelligence community, but this is probably the brightest reddish line of them all. I mean, look, uh, information sharing, um, working together with our partners overseas uh, is so much based on concrete trust. And by sharing intelligence that the president was not allowed to share, the U.S. government was not allowed to share, was a breach of that trust. And that is extremely significant in our business. You can share intelligence, okay, if you have the right to share the intelligence. The president, legally, he right. is he, ha- he has the right no. to declassify anything on the spot. But you would it's have a conversation a with everybody about why you should and how you'd because share Because you don't want to compromise sources and methods. Right. Now, the problem with this intelligence, and I totally disagree with the tweet that the president sent out that, oh, I, I am the president, I can share intelligence. No, because this is not your intelligence. This is not intelligence owned by the United States government, I am- collected by the NSA or the CIA. This is information that was given to us by our allies, and it was given to us in a way that we're not even allowed to share it with other intelligence agencies inside the United States, not even with our closest allies even. And you share it with a hostile power that is actually considered a hostile power by the people who gave it to us. Think about it. Who is the biggest ally of the Syri- of, of, of the Russians in Syria? Hezbollah and Iran. Now, if the Russians have some significant intelligence, do you think they're not going to give it to the Iranians and to Hezbollah, which is the number one enemies for Israel? It would really be like you go out of town, uh, I go to your house, and invite a bunch of my friends over to your pool. It's not my pool. It's your pool. Yeah, and, and you pee it. in the pool. I would definitely yeah, piss in your that's, pool. That's, I have, as a know, matter of fact. Just to um, make the situation It worse. was winter. It wasn't that big of a deal. Ali Sufan, everybody. Uh, follow him on Twitter at Ali underscore H underscore Sufan. Get the new book. It is really, really good. Uh, I love you, my friend. I'm proud of Thanks, you. Brother. And I appreciate you joining us today. And hopefully we'll talk to you very soon. Thanks, guys. Always a pleasure. We'll be right back with comedian, actor, and now uh, director as well, Dimitri Martin.